Good morning, good morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, I got a, a word I want to read to you this morning before we start the worship. That's a word that the Lord has been speaking to me throughout the last few weeks, and I hope that it stirs you up to worship him in spirit and truth. It's from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 17. Now the Lord is a spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then in Galatians says, it is for freedom he set us free. If Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. Amen? Amen. You have, I hope you feel free this morning. And we, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Now, the thing that really caught my attention the most is that scripture that I started off with. He said, the Lord is the spirit. And then he finishes this, that chapter and says, the Lord is the spirit. He is in us. The spirit of the Lord comes to abide in us. Jesus, we, te we teach this to small children, right? Jesus is in us. He's in you. He's in you. He's in me. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Jesus is with us. So we should have great expectation here this morning. Yes. We should have great expectation as we're walking this life, right? He's with us. We want him to be happy with us. We want to walk right with us. And he teaches us by gathering together, by reading the word, how to walk right with them. Because we have this thing called the flesh that causes us trouble. But yet he has overcome it. And he's given us the ability to walk with him and perfecting us with him. But there's good news. As we keep walking with him, there comes to a place where we, we either die and go on to be with him, or he comes and takes us up. And the good news is that when we, that happens, it says we see him and we become like him. For we see him how he's, he is. Now he's in you. He's in you in heaven. He's in me. But it's just you and him. It's just me and him. This is all gone. We no longer have to battle the corruptness of this world. Sin has been done away with. You've been now made pure and holy in the sight of God for all eternity. And guess it's what else? It's us together. It's just us in God. He says the two shall become one. So now we're all one with God for all eternity. It's exciting, right? Yeah. I was, you know, as I think about this, be bopping around in heaven thinking, does Jesus come to like see me once in a while? And the Lord says, he's, he's, he's in you. It's just you and him always. Now, I suppose that once in a while I'll come along, but it doesn't matter because all of us together have the glory of God. All of us together have the revelation of who Christ is. Without the flesh, we're perfected. So we're walking along in heaven, and we have this great victory that he's made for us. But then there comes a time while we're, we're there where he calls us into the holy city. You ever read that? I think I'm making this up. It's in Revelation 21. And guess what we carry in there? It says the kings of the earth come into the holy city and they carry the glory of God. I don't know what else you might be taking in there, but I know one thing. You're carrying the glory of God because it's you and Jesus. It's us and Jesus going into the holy city. Isn't this exciting? We're out there in the world. You know, he says he calls the kings of the, who are the kings of the earth? We are coming into the holy city. What are we going in there for? What's the expectation? I can tell you what the holy city looks like. Oh, I'm not going to take up the time, but I know one thing, it is good. Yeah. Michael and I were talking on Wednesday, he said, boy, if all I get is streets of gold, and if all I get is a, a mansion in heaven, I'd be seriously disappointed. Well, and so would I, because I don't have to worry about that, though. You're carrying the glory of God. How much more do you want? But you're walking into the holy city, carrying the glory of God. We're one in Christ. And guess what we're coming in there to do? Well, you might have seen Jesus while you were outside there. He may have came and visited you, but he's always with you. But now we get to see him. The Bible says that it no longer is the sun needed because the city is lit. Isn't it something to be lit? Don't you young people like that? This city is lit <laughs> by the glory of God. It's lit. And it says the lamp, the lamp is Jesus. So we're walking in there and it's lit. We're excited to see him. And then we see him. We see the master. We see the creator. We see the one and only king of kings and lords of lords. And we come together with the glory of God. And we worship him. And we worship him. And we worship him. Can you see that in your heart? How glorious that's going to be. 
I mean, the streets of gold will be beautiful. The mansions will be great. But we'll be able to gather, to bring into the city the glory of God and worship the one who is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. So let's worship him together this morning, thinking that's where we're heading, right? Amen. Amen.
This is the praise we attend now on again. We open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. We open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. We open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the drop on that again. This is the sound of the drop on that this is the sound of the drop on Friday.
freely gives. He freely gives his joy. And we can live in freedom and live from a place of gratitude. It is our joy to praise you, Jesus. We love to praise you, Jesus. We say yes this morning.
church. I believe the Lord is pleased in this this morning. So we're just going to continue to sing this right now. Thank you. 
You better get used to it because in Revelation 4 verse 8, it says the four living creatures and they do not rest day or night saying, holy, holy, holy. Sometimes you just get a glimpse of God or God touches your heart in a certain way and you just can't help but, you know, what a privilege. What a privilege. I don't know, Phil was supposed to, to uh, transition sermon, but I just felt like, you know, it, it, these kinds of things are just practice for heaven. <laughs> they really are practice for heaven. Day and night, they do not sing, cease to say, holy, 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 holy. Because when you get a, a real glimpse of God, words are hard to come out sometimes. All you can do is repeat what you're seeing and, and you just say, what a joy to honor you when I see you this morning. And so, Father, it has been our joy to worship you. You are far above all blessing and praise. The infinite God. And you humble yourself to hear our praise, to be with us, to dwell with us. Who can comprehend your heart? But we thank you you have revealed this to us through your Son and through your Spirit. And we thank you for the privilege of seeing you, knowing you, and worshiping you this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going uh, we're gonna to move into the Word this morning, um, and I'll bring us our announcements at the end of service to close out so I can uh, invite Leslie to share share the word of the Lord with us this morning. Good morning, church family. <laughs> what a joyful day. And the readings today from God's word. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. 2 Chronicles 32, 30. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gihon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Psalm 46, 1 through 11. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamoth. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, 
the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Who has made desolations in the earth? He makes wars to cease and to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Up the slides late, which had some of the scriptures on them. And, uh, I was kind of running behind on things. <laughs> you know, we've been speaking about the fruits of the Spirit being, uh, the, well, we'll be looking at a series on the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, this morning I want to look at the fruit of joy. And as I was meditating, Galatians 5, this is on Galatians 5.22, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And I was meditating on the fruits, and I, I realized that the first three fruits are deep needs and desires in every one of us. We all have a need for love, right? We want to be loved for who we are. We all have a need for peace. Oh, that I would... I spoke on that a couple weeks ago. Oh, that I would have peace in my life, peace in my mind, peace with my past. And we all have a need for joy. I want to just be happy. And what we don't realize, and, you know, we don't have a need for long-suffering, which is the next one, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's something special about the first three being something that we need. And because these are deep needs and desires, we are driven in our life to fulfill them. We may not realize that, but we live our life seeking love and all that comes with it, seeking peace and seeking joy. And I could go into that. I don't want to I have a long word this morning, and I, I don't want to go into that, but we don't even know. You know, I don't think we ever stop to say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Even even like, you know, you take some of the perversion and sin that you see in society, it's people that are just driven to fulfill a need for love, for instance. Um, and when it comes to joy, I believe that need for joy and the drive for joy, we end up seeking it in the wrong place. I'll say that. So what do I mean by that? The Bible says we created, God created us body, soul, and spirit, right? Body is our, our you know, our body, right? So, and in general, we seek pleasure because it fulfills something in our body. I love a hot shower, for instance. It gives, there's nothing I find very pleasurable to get in like a big, you know, as opposed to what the, you get in, Nowadays, you know what I'm talking about, right? But because we have such a need for, for joy, we often seek it in pleasure, which caters to the body. Um, you can tell I love Oreos, right? <laughs> but, but a lot of what we are seeking through, we're real. We don't realize we're seeking something other than what we're looking for. In other words, it's because of, you know, the Bible says the last days that people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And you see that in society. Any boundary that God has given has just been thrown away. As people seek pleasures outside his permitted will and outside his pleasure, outside his boundaries. And what happens is, and let's be maybe honest, 
things are pleasurable, and some things are not, like taking a shower is not sin, okay? In fact, for some of us, the people I work with, it would be good if they took a shower. <laughs> Phil knows what I mean. <laughs> we better scrub that one from the tape. <laughs> But, but often this pursuit of pleasure crosses the boundaries into sin. You know, Moses, it says, chose to endure affliction with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is a pleasurable for a season. The people that are out there sleeping with one another and practicing, you know, I don't even want to go into it. You know what it is. It's pleasurable but for a season but because of that it says the wages of sin is death outside of it it will never be satisfied outside of God's true way of seeking joy it will never satisfy and second of all you know pleasures can be pleasures are only temporary as much as I put in a bigger hot water tank after a while that hot water is now cold you know the Oreos, they take a toll. So, but my point is, we're, we drive, I want us to see that we don't recognize that we are driven for, with a need for joy, but we often try to substitute it with pleasure. Or, which caters to the body, or we go to the soul. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions, and we just seek happiness. I, if I could, if I could just find a spouse, I would be happy. You know how many times I've heard that over the years, and then three years later, if I had just stayed single, I would be happy. <laughs> right? It's true. If I, if I could just have this, and we're driven in our soul for happiness, and again. These things aren't bad. Some of these things are, yes, they're outside of God's boundaries and their sin. But they're not, some of these things are not wrong. You know, marriage is good. It's honorable. Uh, but what happens is, just or, or even the Bible speaks about, like, the joy of a child being born. You know, childbirth is joyful. Sometimes. You have a child born with a birth defect. Your child is born, it may be joyful, and then nobody knows what the future is. And sometimes th that anticipated joy is, or, you know, th that earthly joy is not what you thought it would be. Let me know what I'm talking about. I don't want to go into details, but... And what the Bible, and what I want us to see is, what the Bible teaches is, true joy doesn't come from bodily pleasures, doesn't come happy, it's not from soulish happiness. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is joy. True and lasting joy comes only through a union with God, when you're in right relationship with Him. You know, have I made my point? I mean, you understand that we're, we're, we, we have a des deep desire for joy, and we often, we don't even know why we do it, and we look for, we, try, we, we get into these things that are pleasurable, and not that they're wrong even sometimes, or we think these things will make us happy, not that they're wrong. If I just get a new car, I'll be happy. If I just had a different job, I'd be happy. If I just had more money, I'd be happy. If my husband just shut up, I'd be happy. <laughs> but how many of those are just temporary things? And so I want to look this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 47. I titled this message, A River of Joy. And even though we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, I believe Psalm 47, especially verse 4, 
can teach us some things about true joy as opposed to the fleeting, fleeting the, 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 the temporariness of pleasure or happiness. Is everybody with me? Seems like I'm good? Okay. Where was I? Psalm, what did I say? 46. 46. I, oh, I meant 46. Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So I want to what is I want to look at that verse and tell us and see what that teaches us about true joy. Now, in order to understand that, I have to give a brief history lesson. So first of all, in the old in, in Bible times, people lived in walled cities. And like Jerusalem, I was reading, some of the walls in Jerusalem were 20 feet thick and over 23 feet high. Massive walls. But most cities had rivers or streams that ran through them. But Jerusalem did not have a water source. The water source was outside the city at a, at a well or a spring called the Spring Gihon. And so if you wanted water, you had to go outside, lug your, you know, your jug or whatever you use, you know, whatever they used, the lambskin, and bring it back. And so Hezekiah was king, and, and uh, so what he decided to do is he started a project, and he, uh, they dug basically a tunnel in rock, and I, I had written down how the archaeolog archaeologists have discovered this tunnel, and I wrote down the statistics, and it was amazing, and I forgot them. Um, but it was something like 1,700 feet long, in solid stone that once he and it, it channeled the water from this spring into the city and then there was a big like uh, cistern cut out of rock and that pe and there was a, uh, an incline that people could go down and and basically get their water inside the city instead of going out this so this is something he did and then he covered up the outside spring and the reason he did that is because it gets, to the, it gets to the context of why this psalm was written. Because in Bible times, there was, well, I wouldn't even go to Bible times. There was a, there was a, the world power at this day of Hezekiah was uh, a guy named Sennacherib. And they were dominating everybody. They, they took uh, Samaria, they took the northern kingdom, they took very, you know, they were the world power. And so they invaded Jerusalem. And what did they do? Now, they would surround the city. And, what, and, and if you were lived in a walled city, they would, either, they would basically try to starve you out because if you didn't have anything to drink or eat, that's the best way to win a victory. Of course, then they'd build their catapults and launch things at you and all of that. But what, <clears throat> the reason that Hezekiah built that underground or it built that underground tunnel is that now when an invading army came they had no idea where the water source was because prior to that if somebody came to jerusalem you, you only can live three days without water all they got to do is shut the city up for three days and and they've won but but now because of the water source that was undis undiscoverable when this king Sennacherib invaded, or uh, and he basically sent his lieutenant Rabshaka, uh, which you can read about in Isaiah 36 and 37. When they surrounded Jerusalem, they had no idea about the water source. Now, can you see now why they said there is a river? There is a river. They're surrounded by 108, the Bible says 185,000 men surrounding that city. But now, instead of being conquered in two or three days, they have an undisturbed water source. And long story short, I'm not going to go into the entire story, but Hezekiah prayed, he went to Isaiah who prayed, and... Lo and behold, God sent an angel and killed 185,000 of them. It's an interesting story about how the devil comes to attack you and 
all of that. But So this psalm was written after God sent that angel to kill these people. And so they were rejoicing. First of all, they said God is a refuge, right? But they said there is a river. And they recognized the river was not the physical river, but it was the presence of God among them. It's, and that's, that's a theme throughout Scripture. Boy, I feel like I'm just not connecting this morning. And um, so, I mean, the Bible's replete with, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to take the time to, to turn to some of these scriptures, but the Bible's very clear that God is likened in scripture to rivers, to waters. I mean, Isaiah 33, 21, the majestic one, the Lord shall be for us a place of rivers. You see a river flowing out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, you, out of the garden in, uh, of Eden, uh, out of Eden into the garden, you see a throne, a river proceeding from the throne of God in Revelation 22. Jesus said, he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow river, rivers of living water. I preached a, a few months ago. The river is symbolic of, the, of God himself. It's, it's quite clear. And... Uh, so what I want us to see is there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So the first thing that said to me was this. There is a river, the presence of God, whose streams make glad the city of God. Joy is to be a characteristic of the people of God. Right? Joy is to be the char a characteristic of the people of God and of a believer. Philippians 4.4 4 in the Living Bible says this, Always be full of the joy of the Lord. I say it again. But you can't help but read the New Testament. And, and one of the things that's striking is joy. They got beat by the Sanhedrin, and they rejoiced. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for their name. Acts 13, they were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. They ate their food with, with the singleness of heart and joy, or they rejoiced. Paul, in prison, rejoiced in the Lord always. I say, I, again, I say I rejoice. Jesus said, my joy I give you. Spoke about giving his joy. The simple point is that, in fact, I heard someone, one quote said, joy is the evidence of the presence of God in a life and a community. <laughs> Do you believe that? I remember, we say we do, but if you think, oh, how does the world see the church? Do they see the church and God's people as a joyful people? No, I didn't know. My daughter, when she was 14 years old, she doesn't even remember she said this. 14 years old. She said to me, Dad, I don't want to go all out for God because I don't want to be miserable like the, pe <laughs> like the, like the people in the church. Okay, out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> it's funny and it's sad. It's, if you look at the New Testament, joy is to be characteristic of a believer and of the city. God's people to be a rejoicing people. And I don't say this to condemnation. I say it because... It's an indication of spiritual health. And, and, and some would say, well, I'm not like Brian. I'll pick Brian. He's a very exuberant. But, you know, but that's not joy. 
The word joy in Strong's dictionary just says a calm inner delight. Yes, sometimes you can swing off the chandeliers, but really it's an inner delight that grips your spirit that is with at all times. For better, for worse, it, it never, it's unshakable inner delight. And so, joy is to be characteristic of our life. It's to be a, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible teaches, and I believe this, this is one of the lessons from this psalm, we have an inextinguishable source of joy. Because God is the river. God, you know God is the most joyful being in the universe. People, people are so perverted in how they think of God. This ang- they, the, the, the Muslims think it's Allah, this angry, distant God. And, and No, he is the most joyful. The reason it's these are fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, because that's who he is. And connecting with who he is, you experience who he is. People have the perverted view of God. He is the most joyful being. <laughs> he rejoices over his people. I think it was Zephaniah said. So we have access to this indis- inextinguishable source of joy. And you think about this stream. Everybody got the picture of the stream. This is important to hear what. You had this outside spring. It's now hidden. It goes into the city. What does it teach us about joy? It teaches us, first of all, the source of joy is hidden to the world. Why is that important? Because we think, well, I find joy in something external that brings pleasure and ends up often bringing death. Or pain. We think it'll bring, if I just get something external in my life, I will be joyful. No. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit in John 7. The first thing is a source of joy, true joy, is hidden to the world. And that's why they'll never know. What? How come you're so happy? How can you be going through that? How could you just learn your daughter was, is going to be born with a half of a heart? And one of my kids was. And you still have joy. Well, the world will never see it. They don't know. Because it's God himself in you. This joy, the second thing, is think about this. Seneca or Rabshaka and 185,000 uh, Assyrians are surrounding uh, Jerusalem. True joy is independent of external circumstances. We don't believe that. People do not believe that. They think, I can't be joyful until. Until this happens in my life, that happens in my life, I get, you know, my spouse changes, this changes, I get more money, get a job. Jesus hung on a cross. This is for the joy that was set before him. True joy, true biblical joy is independent of external circumstances. Because the externals out here, the internal is that connection with the living God who is the infinite source of joy and life. third thing this said to me was true joy. Again, thinking about the army. No one can steal your joy. <laughs> no one can steal your joy. People don't, again, I'm just saying, I observe people don't believe that. I would have joy, but, you know, my wife just nags at me all the time. I would have joy, but my boss is this and that. 
Nobody can steal your joy because if it's hidden and connected and a fruit of the Spirit in union with God, you tell me how somebody gets in your heart. No one can steal your, your, uh, your joy. Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and your joy may be full. He said, you're going to have tribulation, you're going to have some tough times, but here I'm telling you, I'm telling you ahead of time, you abide in me, walk with me, do what I ask, nobody's going to take your joy. And say this, joy, I want to say this, joy is not the absence of suffering. It's the presence of God. (laughs) Joy is not the absence of tribulation. It's the presence of God. And that's good news because we can't change some of the things in our life, but we can, as believers, be carriers of his presence in every aspect of life. Another interesting thing about this, I was meditating. This river that streams made glad the city of God was the work of the king. It was King Hezekiah who built that. You know, it was King Jesus who hung on a cross to die for our sins, to reconcile us to God, to put to death in the flesh, every all the enmity with God, to forgive us, to restore us, to dwell within us. Why? And that he could pour his spirit out. Joy is the work of the king. And that's important because you say, I want joy in my life. Let me go buy a new car. I want joy in my life. Let me go change it. I mean, no, that's why men, I I realize my wife would tell you from her younger years, oh, man, let's just buy house, 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 car, car, this, that, this, that. It's the work of the king. And he's already paid for it. That's the good news. Another interesting thing is, you know, during this, uh, this trial where, where Jerusalem was surrounded by the army, your, the joy sustained them. That river sustained them. Joy will sustain you through things that you don't think you can be sustained from, you go through. How can you go through that? There's a joy inside of me. I, I mean, we were asked that when our daughter was born. I said, how can you go through, how can you be happy? How come you're not coming unglued? Uh, is it just a joy? There's a God in heaven that we're in union with. I don't know. I feel like I am not connecting this morning. Yeah. And in thinking about this verse, it says this. It says, there, are, there is a river whose streams make glad. There are many aspects. To, uh, God is a source, but there are many ways to connect to the sources of joy in God. One of them which was today. Worship connects us to joy. Worship connects you to God that releases a joy. Worship is not meant to be a funeral. It's to be a celebration. But beyond that, so you think about this. I was thinking about water and different things. In Zechariah 13, it says this in verse 1, In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity. 
as I already started to talk about this, the first joy is the joy of salvation. Can, can you remember when your sins were forgiven? Was there anything more joyful as the dump loads of guilt and shame and filth and perversion were just wiped off in your life and Jesus took that? Was there anything that brought a greater joy? I know for me it was like the grass was greener, the sky was bluer. Is there anything that when you truly understand and repent of your sins and Jesus forgives you and he comes in and he wipes it clean, is there any greater joy? And the reason I raise that is because what happens is, as we, you know, we have an enemy who likes to just get into our life and sow things and bring you reminding of the past and you're reminding you didn't live up to that and you did that. And next thing you know, the joy of salvation begins to wane because you've lost sight of the joy of salvation and what he's done. The second one is the joy of his presence. The Bible says in Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. How many of you know what I mean by the presence of God? Not his omnipresence, his manifest presence. The presence like in, in Chronicles where people, the priests couldn't even stand because the glory of God filled the temple. When you are in that Shekinah presence, in the presence of the most joyful being in the universe, there is fullness of joy. The things of this earth will grow strangely dim, I can tell you that. You will suddenly, when you are in the presence of God, you don't care about a car, and you don't care about a job, and you don't care about this. All you care about is him and his presence. And that leads to the third thing. You know, we often talk about the joy of salvation, and rightly we should. But you know, there's a joy that comes from knowing him. Not knowing about him. Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You tell me why we pursue a car, a video game, some, out, some sex outside of marriage, some homosexual relationship. You tell me why we pursue those things instead of knowing him, the God of all joy. And the fourth stream, if you will. And there's probably a lot more. I'm just giving you a few to think about. The fourth stream is this. It's the stream of being in his purpose. What do I mean by that? If you look at, you know, Jesus told the parable of the talents. And he said, well done, our good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. There is nothing, I shouldn't say nothing because I'm using a lot of nothing, but they're all in God, so they are all are true. But when, but when you are serving God, and you are serving him well in what he's called you to do, and you, and you hear, you're doing good, son. You tell me that doesn't bring a joy that makes anything on earth dim in comparison well, you did a good job in worship today, Phil. Oh, thank you, Father, for telling me. Is there a greater joy than fulfilling your purpose in your service? And how about the old, now the old timers used to call this the soul winner's joy. You read in Luke 15, I tell you, there's more joy 
over uh, a sinner who repents and the 99 who didn't repent. One of, what, God gets, what God gets excited is when people start changing, repenting, and coming to him. And lives start getting cleaned up. And you want joy? You participate in those purposes. Participate in the purpose of serving him. Participate in the service of you know, sharing the gospel. Participating in helping people come to God. There is a joy that is just indescribable. And if you doubt me, go lead someone to the Lord and you look at what it does to you. A while back I was I was at work and I, I forget, I was teaching on something on Wednesday night and I was beating myself up. I'm like, Lord, I've never even shared you around here. and I was just beating myself up. And then as I was there at late at work, waiting for the Wednesday Bible study, this, this woman said, boy, you're here awful late. I said, yeah, I have to teach Bible study. You do? Do you know anything about Revelation? And then I just, for an hour, shared the gospel with her and one of the Hindu people just listened. You want to talk about joy, unspeakable? There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Because there's joy in these streams. See, it's hard to sustain joy when, when you're, you just live for yourself, you live for fleshly pleasures. Not that they're wrong. And that's the, kind of the curse on the American church. The curse on the American church is we know the joy of salvation and now we can have our, our, our pleasures of a four-bedroom colonial, two-and-a-half baths in the countryside. Everything's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But it's pleasure or happiness. It's not joy. And the pulpits in America haven't done much help in his preaching to the flesh. Yeah, give to God and he'll give to you. Give to God and you'll be wealthy. I don't want that kind of wealth. I'll take the true riches, though. Let me close. I'll give you seven thoughts. Maybe eight. I don't know how many I got here. Seven things that will impact your joy. This may be a little real talk. Ready for some real talk? One of the things that will increase your joy is to stop being satisfied with the joy you have. Jesus said, um, he said in Luke 15, there is more joy, which tells me that joy is not like I have joy or I don't have joy. It's, it's like a cup, or it's analog. You can have some joy, a little, and you can go. But what happens is, it'd be like that person who went down to the river, and they brought a, they brought a, a, a pot of clay. This is how much joy I've got. Every day, they get their pot, their pot of water. That's how much joy i got. But you know, there's more joy if you get a bigger pot. But we get satisfied with where we are because we feed our pleasures and we feed our soul happiness. So we get a, enough joy in this Christian life. I got my little pot full of joy. That's all I need. And so God comes along and says, no, I want you to have more joy because I love you. Let me send some suffering in your life. Let me break that pot because I want to do some digging because I want to give you a bigger pot because I want you to have more joy. But we get self-satisfied. I didn't realize that's what I've been praying for. I, I, a lot of what I'm about to say is coming out of my personal devotion. I want more joy. More 
Another thing that is a joy, I don't know if I want to use killer, but impacts your joy, is busyness. It says in Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. But you know, we're, we live in a life, and I can tell you, every second of every day is accounted for. And if God wants to take five more minutes in the morning for devotion, I can't give it. I've got too much to do. Too busy. Too busy. Got to do this, got to do that. And what happens is, I think, I really do think, as I was chewing on this for my own life, I think the busyness impacts our ability to connect to the joy of God. No, I'm not saying we, I believe, I believe in service. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think we're over-serving God. But I do think there may be some things on our schedule. Maybe we need to trim back. Maybe we need to eliminate. Because what happens is, well, I play these video games. Is that feeding the joy of the spirit? Probably the flesh. It's not wrong. It's not the same about busyness. Oh, another one. You know, what do you call water when it doesn't flow? Stagnant, swamp, stinky. stinky. There you go. <laughs> That's right. What do you call a believer who's selfish and stingy? Lacks generosity in time, talent, energy, money, whatever it might be. Stingy, stinky. What happens is, the Bible says given it will be given. And what happens is we, we get to a place and we just stop the generosity. Oh, what did Jesus say, the man, uh, the rich young ruler? Go and sell all you have and follow me. You mean you want me to be generous? It says he went away sorrowful. You cannot be stingy and selfish with your time, your money, your talent, and, and expect the joy of the Lord to flow. Another one, I was thinking about this. Elijah's brook. He called for a famine on the land. There's a famine on the land. This is in uh, 1 Kings seven, uh, 16 or 17. And so what he has, he's at a brook. There's no food. There's a famine in the land. But God says, I'm going to provide for you. And he provides with a raven. And you know what? Elijah was content with what God provided. You want to know why we lack joy? Because we are not content in some of the seasons that we're at where God is providing for us. He's doing what he said. He said, listen, I'll give you clothes and a place to live and food. Yeah, but I didn't want ramen noodle. I really wanted filet mignon. And I didn't want this junker of a car. I wanted myself a Cadillac, you know. And I didn't want this rented you know, uh, studio dump. I want to meet that two and a half, four and a half, uh, four bedroom colonial, two and a half baths in the suburbs. <laughs> and what happens is we act out of that, out of our discontentment. And it robs us from the spiritual joy that God could, we could find with God feeding us with the ravens. With, gut, with the lack of busyness and drinking from the brook. A few more and I'll be done. I want to find this verse in Luke. Is it in Luke? No, Matthew, I'm sorry. Matthew 25, 23. I'm sorry, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. He said, but he who received the stone on stony places, this is he who hears the word immediately and receives it with joy, but has no root in himself, 
but endures only for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. What is he saying there? He's saying, you've heard the gospel, you've received Christ, you've stepped out with that joy, and then all of a sudden, because there's some either hard things in your life, or hard things in your heart because there's some stony places. And God's, you know, you got joy, but now God comes and says, that's right. I'm telling you, I want you out of that relationship. I'm telling you, you need, you need to forsake that sin. I want to go, you need to humble yourself here. I'm telling you, you need, and he starts to want to go deeper to the hard places in our heart. Or we receive Christ and all of a sudden it's not sunshine and unicorns. He never promised sunshine and unicorns. He promised himself. So what, what happens, what am I saying is, what is God, it's been a hard place that God is trying to get in your heart. He's trying to drill out that stony place. Let the rock come out that it can fill it with joy. This one is hard because it hits home. You want to know why? What we can do to find tap into more of the joy that the Lord has? Turn from the idols that we have. What do I mean by that? We have this desire for joy. But we can also substitute that joy with some pleasure, something that makes us happy. And we actually, without even knowing it, we put it before God. So that's what he was showing me, some things that I do in my life. If, well, I guess I'll be honest, for me it's food. I can find pleasure in food. But God would say, why don't you put that, don't find the pleasure there. Why don't you try to go deeper and find joy in me? Put that idol away. Making sense? See, there are things that we substitute, and they're not even bad. It's not bad to have a few Oreos. No, it's bad to have the box that you rented by... It's really bad to have two boxes. <laughs> I could eat the world record. I won't say that. But you see what I'm saying? I, I, there are their idols. He doesn't want that. He will put his finger on it if we're listening. And then the last one is, I'll say, is focus. Well, even before that, very quick. It said, in, <clears throat> I'll read you one other scripture. I wasn't going to read this. Jesus said this in John 15, 10 to 12. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that, with, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Well, what is the condition there for his joy? Get out of willful sin. I'm not talking about people that struggle with sin. That's what I'm talking about. But you cannot live in willful sin and say, God, I'm going to go my way and do what I want and expect that you'll have his joy. But the last one, and I'll close with this, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice that you got a new car? Rejoice that, wow, I just bought some new ox and I can't come to the banquet because I got to go break them and plow them. Just bought this land, rejoice. No. What's it say? So the question is, what are, what, what's our focus? Is it really in the Lord? Is it really? 
Or is it for these substitute things? And, and again, well, I'll close with this. It, it, it's not that these things are bad, but they keep us from, Jesus said, he spoke about more joy. He spoke about fullness of joy. And I, and I really do believe if we can adjust our focus and heed a couple of these things he said, you know what, we'll all of a sudden take that small pot and say, listen, heck with this small pot. I'm going to try to drag this big honking one down to the river because I want more joy. Let's stand. somebody come up. We just want to pray and you know I <laughs> maybe God spoke to you like he spoke to me as I was chewing on this word. It, there are idols, there are busyness, need to reprioritize the schedule. Maybe there are just time to no longer be stingy with your time and your service. I don't know. Maybe it's just an awareness that I didn't even know I I, I, I had joy. I didn't know I could have more. And I, I have no problem with making the things of this earth grow faint, faintly dim. And that will give me more of you. So, Father, I thank you that you are the God of joy, and I pray you'd fill us with joy in believing. God of salvation, send down your Holy Spirit that we would have fullness of joy. I pray that today, somehow, you use the simple words that I spoke to shake up things in lines. That we want more joy. I'll break this pot, God, if it be more, if I could get more joy. So, Father, I pray right now by the Holy Spirit you would reveal to your precious people that which is key for them. I pray for the stagnant. Some of you know what I mean. You're just, you're not, it's not your, you're, you're generous, but you've just been stagnant in your faith stagnant in your journey with God. And you find out in that stagnation, it's like a, a cistern that can hold no water. Don't know why. The joy of your salvation is not what it once was. But I pray, as David prayed, restore unto us, O Lord, the joy of our salvation. Let there be a restoration today. Father, for those that are here and looking for joy in all the wrong places, may you touch them today with your spirit. Jesus. Joy is not in that bottle. It's not in that relationship. It's not in another physical act of the flesh. 
So I'm asking today you connect your people with you the most joyful being in all of creation. Fill us, Lord. Fill us with joy. Bring us deeper. Lift your hands to the Lord. He's speaking to you. Break my pot for more joy. Dig deeper. Take the stony places out, Lord. God, I forsake that pleasure. I forsake that thing I thought would make me happy because I want my joy in you. I want all my joy in you. All my joy in you, Lord. God, give us opportunities to share our faith. Move us, O oh Lord, to help bring people to you and to disciple them. Smile on your people. Let them sense a smile. That you rejoice over us with singing. And Father, we don't want to just know about you. But we want to know Jesus. Take us deeper, Lord. Take us deeper. Take me deeper. A church of joy. A people of joy. Pray you seal this word in Jesus' name. just take a few moments and worship if you're here and you, you know God spoke to you and you like some prayer we'll be glad to pray with you maybe you just need to do business with God if you need to go you're dismissed well let's just I just sense the Holy Spirit is not done